Pain and Gain, a cinematic classic. It was only after Tom Brady won his fifth Super Bowl as quarterback, cementing himself as the king of NFL, that I realized why Michael Bay is so loathed by critics. Success, and supreme mastery of his craft. Tom Brady is inarguably the best player in NFL history. He has the physique of a god and a beautiful supermodel wife. He has everything to be celebrated, but we hate him. And while Michael Bay is no underwear model like Tom Brady, he does spend a lot of time with them as a recurring director for Victoria's Secret. And even before he ventured into film, Michael Bay was an award-winning photographer and director. He had won the Oscars of television commercials and had many music video awards under his belt. As Ben Affleck puts it in Armageddon, Michael Bay will do it. He doesn't know how to fail. Compare his success to that of Francis Ford Coppola, the acclaimed director of the Godfather series and Apocalypse Now. He went bankrupt funding his own failed cinematic ventures, and of the 35 movies in his IMDb, maybe five are popularly known, counting the Godfather series as one. How then does Michael Bay fare in the pantheon of successful directors? Well, Spielberg's first flop was his first venture into film. Michael Bay didn't make a flop until his sixth. Only James Cameron stands above Michael Bay and Steven Spielberg in this category. Of James Cameron's seven features with wide release, he has never made a flop. But unlike these directors, Michael Bay has never gone over budget. Well, as long as we don't count this shot. Courtesy of Michael Bay, right there. Right with that guy. Now why would a studio not want that shot in the movie? I got my money back finally. My point is, Michael Bay is a winner, and a crowd pleaser, and he does it all with the flair of Americana, which, dare I say, actually offends cinematic critics who tend to write from extremely liberal cultural centers of America. Places that the 2016 election clearly shows are out of touch with America. Why is this important? Because people, particularly critics, continue to dismiss Michael Bay as an American auteur, a genuine artist with a mastery of his craft. This dismissal could not be more evident than in Pain and Gain, arguably his most important and intellectual film to date. Had it been made by an art house director, critics would have lauded it as a chilling, nail-biting analysis of the culture celebrating greed and criminal behavior that is placed on pedestals in Hollywood. But since it came from a successful, dare I say, mainstream Hollywood director, it was written off as a sad attempt at a low-budget popcorn comedy. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Critics, much to their chagrin, completely overlooked its exacting nature as a satire of the very things it appears to be lauding. And if you miss that too, then have I got an essay that will blow your mind. What is Pain and Gain? On the surface, Pain and Gain appears to be a comedy. In reality, it is a dark assessment of America's idolization of criminal behavior. All of my heroes are self-made. Rocky, Scarface, all the guys from The Godfather, they all started out with nothing and built their way to perfection. Pain and Gain is about a trio of bodybuilders who work their asses off, but aren't seeing results. When's the last time you paid your rent when it was due? They believe in the American dream. Because if you're willing to do the work, you can have anything. That's what makes the U.S. of A great. But aren't seeing it come true. They see white-collar criminals making off with mountains of cash using illegal offshore banking accounts. And they want a piece of the action. It's about the can-do attitude gone wrong. We knew what we were going to do. We're doing it. It's about the culture that idolizes Scarface and Godfather because... Michael Corleone didn't become the Godfather by folding towels. He did it by keeping a gun behind the toilet and knowing what he wants. And I know it might sound strange, I just want a big fat lawn that I can mow until the sun goes down. It's about being a man. A real man. It's about everything that can go wrong with the Nike just do it attitude. And the atrocious true things that did go wrong. Which would almost be funny if we weren't repeatedly reminded that this really did happen in real life. Unfortunately, 
This is a true story. Like the failed kidnapping attempt. He's having Shabbat! Go, 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 go! The other failed kidnapping attempt. What the hell? Asswipe! Did you get him? Frick. The failed attempt at anonymity. You're cologne, Danny. You stinky, awful, vanilla, disgusting cologne. The failed murder attempt. And the other failed murder attempt. I'd get the hell out of there. Fast. And about the accidental murder of a second target. And his girlfriend. What did you do to her? I gave her a horse tranquilizer. Oh, shit. And the terrible job they did covering it up with a chainsaw that didn't work. Oh, shit. Which they returned for a hatchet that did and the grill they used to burn the bodies in plain view of their neighbors while they were on coke. It's about criminal behavior that we dismiss in films like Scarface and Goodfellas because we, as an audience, are protected from it by the phrase, it's just a movie. But Pain and Gain is about the guys for whom it's not just a movie. Finally, it's about the criminal prick who almost let these guys off the hook because he refused to show up to court three times to testify against them. We're gonna walk on this. They got no proof. Because he was being concurrently investigated by the FBI for criminal fraud. But unlike Goodfellas, which asked us to endure criminal behavior for two and a half hours, or Scarface, which asked us to root for a criminal prick doing criminal shit for almost three hours, or Godfather, which asks us to care for a family of criminal pricks for almost three full hours, and then three and a half more. Michael Bay only asks us to endure these criminal pricks for a mere two hours. And he gave us a few laughs while we did so. Until the shit hit the fan. Comedy as Counterpoint in Pain and Gain, Michael Bay masterfully uses comedy as counterpoint. There's some complex engineering no, in these no, things. No, no, to ask the audience, is this kind of behavior really okay? Over the course of the movie, he gradually pushes the limits of acceptable behavior until it's literally not funny anymore. Serena here yeah. is going to be the victim. Who wants to volunteer to be a rapist? Sure. Right here. Can you We're only me? picking one, guys. This is not a gang rape, okay? You sit down. We'll take Brad. Yes. Is he dead? You see how those weights are flush flat on the fucking floor? Well, they shouldn't be because there's a fucking head in between them. Until it's literally not funny anymore. You can't hear nothing, man. I mean, you told me to give her some more tranquilizer, and I did, and I gave her two shots, and I think I gave her too much because now she's not fucking breathing, and we were dancing and having such a good time, and I was smacking her ass, and now she's fucking dead, and you're not here, bro! Until it's no. literally no. not funny no. anymore. Did you get the code? At that point, when the stakes become real, and the audience doesn't know whether to laugh or to cringe, the audience is forced to reckon that this sort of behavior, idolized in cinematic classics like The Godfather series, Goodfellas, and Scarface, is simply not okay. The comedy counterpoint forces the audience to ask itself, why am I so uncomfortable watching this scene? Billy's fingerprints are... Are you, are you nuts? No, I'm not a ball, but I am about fed up with the defeatist attitude, okay? Now grow those fucking hands, now. When it's no worse than my favorite scenes in the gangster classics, the answer is because this actually happened in real life, and Bay won't let you forget it. This is still a true story, is perhaps the most powerful and important break of the fourth wall in cinematic history. What are you doing? You gotta cook this shit outside. Be careful, that's hot. You burn yourself. Let me repeat that. This is still a true story is perhaps the most powerful and important break of the fourth wall in cinematic history. Why? Well, compare it to the classics. While Goodfellas was also based on a true story, and Godfather and Scarface were based in the framework of actual drug cartels, we became acclimated to the violence through the filter of cinema. 
The violence and depravity became easy to dismiss when the people on screen were merely characters in a movie. By contrast, auteur Michael Bay was sticking so shockingly close to the events as they actually happened that he soon recognized the audience would dismiss the facts as cinematic license. And in an act of cinematic genius, Michael Bay was bold enough to take a moment's pause to remind the audience that although this story plays like any other Michael Bay fiction, the vile acts happening on screen actually happened in real life. Here, Michael Bay shows us the domineering mastery of his craft. David Fincher, an old colleague of Bay's from his commercial time at Propaganda Films, says, People know you can do anything in movies, so the real question is what you don't do. Don't be a don't do, you'll regret it. I already regret it. Michael Bay doesn't glorify criminals. Where lesser directors and lauded artists like Scorsese will make movies glorifying a white-collar criminal, greed, drug abuse, breaking the law, and generally sociopathic behavior, Michael Bay does not. Where Coppola might take the easy route of making the audience root for a violent criminal for three hours only to defend his moral base or redeem the morality of the movie with a half-assed and then the villain gets what's coming to him. Michael Bay actually makes fun of these criminals. Put the fucking thing away. Okay, okay. I need to read the manual. I don't figure it out. It no, here, you take it. He actually treats the criminals appropriately. What the fuck are notaries, man? And he treats their actions appropriately. In the end, after viewing our past performance, we could come to only one conclusion. We're so much better when we wing it. In Pain and Gain, Bay does not allow you to enjoy their violence. He does not allow you to root for the protagonists despite the fact that they are our access characters, because they are not heroes. And he makes a point of it. This was not by I accident. I want the American public to be sympathetic to the killers. Michael Bay has been thinking about making this movie since the story broke in the mid-1990s. This is uh, the cool script of Sitting on the Shelf Project for 12 years. Uh, the producer hung in there and said, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it. And he must have thought it was bullshit. But uh, finally after Transformers 3, I told the studio, I said, I'm done doing robots. I said, I gotta do something small. And I'm gonna do this movie, Pain and Game. He had 20 years to think about his approach to the atrocities they performed, the irony of the failures, and the correct approach to the whole thing. And as a master storyteller, with his pulse on the box office, he knew the right approach, his approach, would not sit well with audiences or critics. That's why he deliberately set the budget so low his investors could not lose money on it. He went guerrilla style, calling in favors for car rentals, locations, etc. He even went digital, using cheap cameras like a $300 GoPro when his tentpole films are shot on IMAX. Again, these were deliberate choices made to get his vision the correct vision to screen, proving you don't need to go broke or overspend by millions like Coppola to make an art house film. Michael Bay, master photographer. And despite so called movie buffs' arguments to the opposite, like WrestleMania, like Anna Nicole Smith, like Jackass, Michael Bay has created something. Because I don't like his films. Michael Bay is a master of composition. That doesn't make his shots better, it just makes them more complicated than the competition. But of all his movies, it's clear that this one is arguably his most important and intellectual film to date. Take this shot for example. A long lens with a severely canted angle. It's unnerving, and at first glance, a mere Bayism. But take another look. Besides his signature foreground, midground, background, break down any Michael Bay shot, and that is basically what you will see. In this scene, Daniel is trying to convince his friend Paul to join him on his quest. But take a look at the only other two things in frame two incomplete building columns. Just as these characters are incomplete and seeking to complete themselves, so are the support columns. Even in the next shot, the rock is featured prominently, but the incomplete support columns are also there to remind us that his character 
no matter how sturdy he looks, is incomplete and deeply flawed. How long have these columns been there, abandoned? Could it be that even after they enact their plan, they will remain incomplete, like the columns in frame? How about this shot, where Bay flagrantly fills the screen with the American flag? Another Bayism? Or a visual reminder? Subtle symbolism that their American dream is just out of reach. Guilty. I know I'm guilty. That's what I said in the beginning of my statement. I said I'm guilty, but what about my second chance? Or this shot, juxtaposing a church against the recently introduced character Paul. The church fills more of the screen than Dwayne Johnson himself, foreshadowing the prominent role religion will play later in the movie. Or this one, running down the hall, the claustrophobia, handheld, the guardrails boxing him in just as the police are boxing him in. How about the opening shot of the movie? Mark's character is working his ass off. He's tiny against a giant painting of a bodybuilder that dominates the frame. This is clearly setting the mood that this character will never feel big enough. That he'll always be shooting for things that are bigger than him. In fact, he spends his time trying to convince himself and others of his own importance. I'm hot. I'm big. Notice how Michael Bay finally does make him big, feeling the frame as he shouts, I'm big. Take this sequence, when Mark's character is finding himself. Foreground, midground, background. As Tony Zhu points out, typical Michael Bay. But notice how Mark's character is really tiny in frame. In fact, he's just one of many. A nobody, really. The image represents how he feels and where he is in life at this point. How many directors can communicate that in one second or less? And when he is feeling fulfilled, a few moments later, he does fill the frame. And the glory of the chandelier, the heavens are opening up above him. This isn't just conjecture. Michael Bay is, after all, an award-winning photographer. And every shot costs money, so he makes every frame a painting. Like this one. Seven beautiful women, front row, the light of heaven above. This image is the very pitch that Johnny is making. He may not even need to be there. And it's all told in less than a second. Moments later, Johnny hits the point home. Now I'm with seven honeys of which I can choose from. <laughs> Remember that shot a few seconds ago that felt superfluous? Now you get it. Oh my god. This guy understands me. How about this shot? It really is the simple things in life. And yet, despite his efforts to keep it simple, big houses, the dock, a speedboat, and financial centers feature prominently in frame, reminding us of all the glitz and glamour that's out there, just beyond our reach, just beyond the bay, tempting us, asking us to chase a dream. But these characters, in their wisdom, simply don't need that. It's really the simple things in life. It's brilliant, communicating the same idea as this scene by lesser directors with infinitely more gravita. Heck, Norm, you know, we're doing pretty good. I love you, Margie. I love you, Norm. <sighs> Michael Bay's mastery is not confined to his visual art either. He is a master storyteller. Take this scene from the trailer. It's called Pain and Gain because it's supposed to hurt. Don't eyeball me, boy. I see your mother walking up and down the street. I could be your stepfather in a week. Objectively a biting and rather hilarious joke, as it plays in the trailer. But as it played in the movie, it revealed the dementia, misogyny, the depravity of this character at this point in the story. He had, after all, gotten away with millions of dollars, trying to fit into a rich neighborhood with stolen cash and stolen property. He was dangerous, and we felt it. At this point in the movie, this line wasn't a joke. Don't eyeball me, boy. I see your mother driving up and down the street looking at me. I'll be your stepfather by the week. It was good drama. It was good cinema. 
But we didn't go in expecting good cinema. Why? Well, because we listened to critics of Michael Bay instead of learning to appreciate his films for ourselves. And this is a film that, by its nature, needs to be appreciated. Pain and Gain did not receive popular attention because it forced the audience to introspect on itself. It honestly asked the audience, what sort of violence in cinema is okay? It leaves the audience with questions. Particularly, how do I feel about the things I just saw? I myself left the theater wondering how to explain the film to friends and colleagues. That's not a good sign for marketers, but as many of my colleagues argue, a great movie should make you leave the theater with important issues to discuss. It should rattle you to the core and make you reassess your values. And in that respect, Pain and Gain ranks at the top of Michael Bay's canon of important cinema. It is perhaps his best film to date. And when critics start to realize the intellectual depth and social consequences of this cult classic, this cinematic masterpiece will find its place in their list of the most important and controversial films of modern cinema. Alongside the classics, it asks you to re-evaluate. Hi, Duncan Willoughby here. Let me know in the comments below if I've changed your mind on anything today. On Michael Bay, on criticism, or the general movie-going experience. I do my best to create thought-provoking and informative media you won't see in the mainstream. And if you like media like this, please give it a thumbs up and consider supporting me on Patreon for more content like this. Like an upcoming essay on George Lucas and Jar Jar Binks. It's important. I don't expect you to understand it immediately, but I am confident that I can make you appreciate it. Because just like Michael Bay, I'm smarter than you. <laughs>